Hi guys, Brian from Brian Boas here. I've been getting a lot of questions from you guys lately, so today I'm going to take a few minutes and answer some of them. And these are all questions that I think most boa keepers could benefit from hearing about, even if you haven't really thought about this specifically. So be sure to stay tuned. So I thought I'd grab a snake, of course. Uh, Give you guys some eye candy to look at this is a cocker key boa this is a male this guy's about six or seven years old he had his first litter last year just a great dwarf boa to keep in your collection i just love how chill this guy is he's like super strong and super muscular but he's only about four feet long so it's kind of the uh, big full-size boa constrictor experience in this cute little pint size package and I just love holding this guy because he's not like trying to get away he's quite chill and just a really pleasant handling experience and you know for these types of videos I, w I always want boas that are going to be cooperative and they're not going to bite me or try to get away or anything like that and the cocker key is definitely uh, a boa to go for I don't have any breeding this year but hopefully next year I'll have another litter so Stay tuned for that. So I got my questions here and let's just go down the list. Okay, number one, are Hog Island Boa good for beginners? Okay, I said before that boas can be kept by beginners and by boas I mean boa constrictors, boa imperator, probably not true red tails. Um, you know, and boas have a reputation of not being a good beginner snake, like you should start off with something that's not as demanding like a corn snake or garter snake or something and move up. And I think this is just kind of ludicrous because, you know, it kind of uh, diminishes the value of those other beginner snakes. And any snake can be kept by anyone who does their homework and researches the, con the husbandry conditions and provides ideal husbandry. So yes, if you are a beginner, if you haven't kept a boa before, certainly you're capable of keeping a hog island boa if you do your research and you prioritize its well-being. You know, that being said, any boa is a commitment, so don't get a pet boa unless you're sure that you can care for it, you have the time, space, and the money, and the your living situation is uh, settled enough that you're not gonna have to move and get rid of it all of a sudden or something like that. So yes, a hog island boa can be a beginner species for the right person, but I don't know if that necessarily applies to your situation. Okay, question two. What if I have a dog or a cat? Will the scent of the other animals get me bitten? Okay, so I guess the person is concerned that if they pet their dog or cat, and then if they go handle their boa, are they gonna get bitten? And I would say this is pretty unlikely unless your animal has somehow developed a taste for dogs or cats. Um, I can't say that it's not gonna happen because of the scent. And you know, any scent that your boa picks up is gonna kind of confuse it. So what I would recommend, regardless of what pets you have, is you always wash your hands before handling a boa. You wanna get all the scents that are on your hands off so the boa just sees your scent and the boa gets used to your scent so that every time you pick it up and handle it gently and calmly, the boa is gonna associate that scent. So you don't want scents of dogs or cats or any other type of animal. You certainly don't want the scent of a rodent because you know boas eat rodents and you're probably gonna end up getting bitten if you've got rodent scent on your hands. So you definitely wanna wash your hands in between touching any animal. So before and then also after, you don't wanna touch another boa. There's a small but um, um, there's a, a chance you could actually transmit diseases from one boa to the next by not washing your hands and this is probably a pretty low risk but it is a risk some people use uh, latex gloves what single use that they dispose of um, I don't think that's necessary and I think it's kind of a waste of the gloves and it generates lots of waste that's going to end up in the landfill so I just wash my hands but I would say it's definitely a good idea you want to wash your hands between handling animals of any type okay next question I'm interested in one of your baby boas. Where can I see availability in prices? Well, the best place to look is my Flickr site, and the link to my Flickr site is in the description below the video. I have pictures of all my available boas up there. Prices are in the comments below, and you can just email me if you have any questions. I also do videos periodically where I update on new births and 
expected litters and available bows, things like that. So be sure to stay tuned to this channel for the uh, latest in the availability of boas here. Okay, I have a female normal boa and it has mites. How do I get rid of these bastards? Nice uh, way to put it. Um, I've actually done videos in the past on mites. So I'm not going to go over the whole spiel here. That would take, you know, 15 minutes or so. I'll refer you to one of those videos, but I would say mites are an absolute nightmare. They're one of the biggest issues that is uh, confronting the herp hobby today. I think people don't, don't take it seriously enough, but it's really a, definitely a disaster to have mites in your collection. Two things you should definitely do. The first is quarantine. Any new reptile in your collection you want to quarantine for a minimum of three months in a separate room. You want to treat it as though it has mites. Even if you want to prophylactically uh, disinfect its enclosure with an anti-mite treatment, you can do that. But just assume anything coming into your collection has mites. And then if you introduce a boa into your collection and it spreads mites to the rest of the animals, this can be an absolute nightmare, especially if you have a large collection, because you have to treat the entire collection to get rid of the mites. Okay, so this involves using uh, different types of toxins. The most common is something called permethrin, which you can get as preventamite spray. It's also in um, a product called um, anti-louse bedding spray. Basically, you spray the bedding to kill head lice and body lice if you've got body lice. But uh, it also kills mites quite nicely. And it's the same ingredient as that found in preventamite. You can get it for a fraction of the cost of preventamite at your local Walmart or uh, drugstore. But you don't have treat just once, you have to treat probably a minimum of three times, about two or three weeks apart. You've got to treat every single enclosure when the snakes aren't in there, which means taking out the snakes, spraying down the enclosure, waiting for it to dry, putting the snakes back. It's really, really uh, laborious and you know labor intensive to do this. Um, but then you have to repeat because the life cycle of the mite is about a month. So if you don't interrupt that life cycle, all you need is one egg and it can start the infestation again. Uh, and in fact, yes, one egg because these suckers can reproduce uh, using parthenogenesis. So one female can start the entire uh, outbreak again. And what people will find is that they do one or two treatments, everything looks cool, they don't see the mites, and then, you know, two or three months down the road, they have mites again and it's in a different section of their collection. You know, an animal that was previously not infected is now infected. So they got to treat again, they do the same thing, and then, you know, a month or two later, they got them again. And by now, they're pulling their hair out, they're going insane, you know, they're thinking about, they just want to burn down their entire house to kill all the mites. And in fact, there have been herb keepers who've gotten out of reptile keeping for good because of mites. It's that bad. I mean, not only do they cause physical damage to your animals by sucking its blood, they cause psychological damage to the keeper because these things are very difficult to get rid of and you can't really even see them. So months could go by, you don't even know if you have an infestation and then it comes back. So just a nightmare to deal with and trust me, you want to do everything you can not to get these things in your collection with very strict and intensive quarantine procedures because if they're in a big collection, it's very difficult to get rid of them. But watch some of those videos, hopefully that should help you. Another nice boa to look at, this guy is a Honduran firebelly boa, born here in 2018, so he's almost five years old. Not breeding this year, but if things go according to plans, this guy will be in breeding trials for the 2024 breeding season, and hopefully we'll have some more of these beautiful Honduran firebellies. So getting back to the questions, okay. How do you breed tar humara boas? What tips and tricks do you have? Well, I'm not gonna get into the whole process of boa breeding in this question and answer because that could take, you know, 20, 30 minutes. I've released quite a few videos in the past on breeding boas and breeding tar humara boas is pretty similar to most other types of boas as far as the generality. So just check out some of those videos and that should at least give you a pretty good starting point. Um, in general, they're about the same difficulty level as most other boas. Usually they breed, sometimes they don't. 
and you know sometimes it's there's really no rhyme or reason to getting a boa to breed for you all right next question is a bci too much for my first snake if i do the research and have the financial capabilities this is very similar to the first question i answered about the hog island is that a good beginner snake again i can't tell you specifically based on your specific situation whether you know you should be keeping this animal but um, you know, Boa Imperator, BCI, Hog Island, etc. They can all be kept by beginners, provided you do the research, you have the equipment and the necessary husbandry supplies, and you prioritize the animal's well-being. So it all comes down to if you're going to do that. All right. Next question: How do you maintain humidity in a larger cage? Well, for me, it's the same way that I maintain humidity in all of my cages. So I've got a water bottle, or water bottle. I have a water dish. Typically, I use eight inch diameter plastic dishes. Uh, so these are not quite big enough for most of my bows to bathe in, but there is a good amount of evaporation from those dishes. Um, I have a room humidifier, a cool mist humidifier that I operate all day, every day pumping out humidity into the air, and it works quite nicely. And then I also spray down enclosures, particularly animals that are about to go into shed. If they're opaque, I'll give them a spray down. And I typically will spray substrate down about once a week. Most of my animals are on uh, coconut or cocoa uh, coir bedding, pro cocoa. And this is a really good substrate for maintaining humidity because it just soaks up all that moisture like a sponge. It maintains a high humidity level and if you have any issues with your boas shedding if you put them on the cocoa core substrate it generally makes a, a big difference so um, i would just do the same thing as i do for my small enclosures just put it in a larger enclosure to maintain the humidity in there next question do you have any argentine boas on the way i really want one Okay, so right now I do have some Argentine boa breeding trials going on. Okay, this unfortunately is no guarantee that I'm going to have Argentine boas. I actually paired them up last year as well. I wasn't successful, much to my chagrin. Um, hopefully this year will be different. Sometimes I just need to pair up the boas, you know, two, maybe even three years in a row until I'm finally successful. So I'm hoping, fingers crossed, for Argentine boas this year. Unfortunately, I won't know probably for another couple months if my female even appears gravid. And then even if she's gravid, I have to wait until the boas are born. I would expect, if I do have them, they will probably would be born in the summer, maybe July or August. So stay tuned to the channel. If I do have baby Argentine boas, of course, I'll make a video. Uh, and I'll be very, very happy because I haven't bred these since 2015 and they are one of my all-time favorite boas. Answering that last question made me want to get out an Argentine. So here you go. This guy is a young adult male. He is, uh, what, he's a 2018, so almost five years old, this guy. Not breeding this year, but to probably put him into breeding trials next year. But these guys, they tend to be a little less uh, calm when I take them out. So he's probably going to try to get away. This is kind of a behavioral contrast to the cocker key I took out at the beginning of the video. But we'll just see how it goes. I've got a few more questions to answer here on my list. Okay. Okay, so this person sent me a picture of what he's describing and he says my boas are getting white patches on their skin after shedding and i looked at the pictures and indeed there are these patches where some of the scales look like they were kind of whitish almost like a bleached look it looked like there may have be a little bit of damage to the scales and he says that this happened after shedding uh, it happened to several of his boas he's not sure why they don't seem to have an infection or anything like that so what is causing this well, this is a phenomenon that can be caused by a number of different things, 
basically it, it indicates that the boa was probably under some kind of stress it may have been exposed to some kind of toxin in the food maybe some kind of environmental stress it could be caused by um, you know mildew or mold or something that caused an infection in the scales it's really impossible to say exactly what caused it without doing some kind of diagnostic testing but when I've seen this happen and heard about it typically it happens after a shed they have these patches of white that appear it almost looks like the boa has lost color in those areas and what usually ends up happening is that the boa will shed again and regain at least some of the coloration and sometimes it goes away sometimes it stays um, I've heard of boas that have this condition and they go on and they don't um, have any other health issues other than they lose a little bit of their color and again I think probably what's going on is you have um, a number of different triggers that can cause this kind of uh, phenomenon and it can be more or less severe I've even heard about the most extreme case is that there was a um, phenomenon where people would buy these rats from low quality rodent suppliers that were known as fat rats and they were very high in fat they were actually called zucker rats it's a lab rat that's bred as a model of obesity and diabetes for studies on obesity and diabetes and they have so much fat that the boas would eat them and have a almost toxic response and i heard about this somebody claimed that the animal or their, their boa ate one of these fat rats and then shed out all of their color and that snake was almost pure white you know because all its color had been lost i'm not quite sure what happened if the animal survived um, the story when I read about this is what this was on a reptile forum maybe 15 years ago it seemed a little fishy to me but uh, who knows it, there does seem that to be that when boas have some kind of stress or toxin exposure it can affect the coloration and the scales and they can lose that color um, in some cases it does come back at least partially in some cases it might not anyway I don't know a whole lot about this um, I haven't really seen it that much in my boas I've seen a few boas maybe have lost color and you know a couple of the scales but you know nothing more than that but if any of you guys have any experience with this please comment below I'd really love to hear about your experience just so we can you know keep the community informed on this phenomenon all right this guy is giving me kind of a workout not holding still all right one more question here I just picked up a baby red tail my in, my intuition says he's a Suriname can you confirm and the person sent a picture of their boa and to me it did look like a Suriname red tail it had you know the red tail coloration the peak saddles and the nice red tail um, I would definitely believe it was a Suriname but the problem about the question I can't confirm from a picture the locality there's really no way to tell okay a boa could be from Suriname it could be from Guiana it could be from Brazil and they all have pretty similar appearances so there's really no way in most cases that you can confirm the locality of a boa just from a picture you could confirm that it might be that locality and that it's consistent you know so if somebody sold that to you as a Suriname I would certainly believe it but I can't confirm it because you really need some kind of documentation if not you know going to the actual area and collecting it yourself which of course is impossible for pretty much anyone so I always ask for that documentation when you buy a boa of its locality and unfortunately nobody who isn't the breeder or you know supplier or collector or whatever that doesn't have that information can confirm that it's 100% that locality okay last question here you have a really impressive boa collection I always enjoy watching your videos well thank you for that um, are there any boas you would like to add to your collection that you don't have already okay well I don't have everything and you know nobody can have everything in one collection there's so many different boas that you can keep you know that being said I can't really add anything more because I'm kind of at my maximal capacity as far as what I can keep um, there are quite a few localities that I would like to add to my collection I probably will never have them in my collection though and you know I'm cool with that I'm really happy for what I've got but I would say off the top of my head um, there's a number of Mexican localities like the Tamaulipas and Cancun boas that I find really beautiful and fascinating and they're kind of dwarfs as well 
Um, in fact, I did have Sonoran boas for a while. I don't have them anymore, but those are another Mexican type that I highly recommend. And then I would say the mainland Central American boas, Nicaraguan, Costa Rican, El Salvadorian. I don't really have any mainland Central American boas. I've got lots of island boas from Central America, but no mainland boas. So I definitely would like to have some of those. And let's just pick a single morph because, you know, we talked about localities I'd like to have. I'd say if I was going to get another morph, probably the Superfire or Leucocystic boa. The, you know, all white boa. Very dramatic to look at. And it's kind of cool because it's just a single gene, you know, and the homozygous state gives it this all white appearance. And it's not really a boa that you would add other genes to because it's kind of isn't really going to do anything. And that's, I kind of like that because it's kind of an end product. It's not like people are going to keep trying to add more and more things together to make this, you know, combo with five, six, or seven genes. It's just one gene that does that. You know, will I ever get one of these? Probably not. They're still really, really expensive um, above my budget. And I'm really not nearly as much of a morph person as a locality person. But, you know, they are kind of cool. Definitely a boa that would be good to take out if you want to impress your non-boa keeping friends. So anyway, that was some questions that I've received. Keep the questions coming and I'll continue to make videos like this. I hope it was helpful. Shoot me any questions or comments you have below. Thanks for watching and enjoy your boas.